Good. All right. So thanks again, everyone, for joining this uh, PAC Fellowship webinar today. Uh, just as a background, uh, PAC Fellowship is a National Science Foundation Fellowship. Um, so it provides funding for US students uh, to go to Germany, uh, University of Kiel, and conduct an extensive uh, research there. Uh, the research can range from three months to six months. And the students have a lot of benefits. They can take courses at the University of Kiel. They have access to all the labs, but they also have funding to travel uh, within the Europe in order to develop collaborations and network. Um, so pre-COVID, uh, so 2019 batch, uh, we had about four students from uh, US visit University of Kiel, and they did some significant research there, uh, which helped them to graduate with their nice thesis. And now we are uh, planning to send again the next cohort in 2021 spring. Um, so this, uh, this seminar, uh, at, we organized to, to basically benefit the, the whole community. A uh, lot of time our speakers are well-known, prestigious folks, just like Sanju Gupta. She's uh, uh, done extensive research in carbon materials and nanomaterials in general, uh, has a range of publications uh, covering various kinds of carbonaceous materials, biosensors, different kinds of thin film devices, um, and very extensive knowledge. Uh, in quantum and, and nano effects. Um, so I think, I think Sanju uh, joined Penn State about a month ago and we were very fortunate uh, that she, she came here um, and she's leading a, a large program in the area of electrocalorie materials. Um, so we, uh, we asked our speakers when, whenever we invite them that a lot of students and postdocs are on the call. So, uh, keep your presentation such that it's more tutorial in nature rather than uh, your results, even though they have lots of amazing results to present. And, and, but this is always a discussion forum for you to learn and gain, ex gain knowledge from this. So uh, please participate in the discussion and, uh, and, and Sanju will, I think, uh, invite you to, to ask her questions as she goes along. So I'll pass this on to Sanju and thank you again so much for taking the opportunity to talk. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pia, for the uh, kind invitation as well as the introduction. So let me uh, share my screen. Okay. All right. Um, so this is the PAC Fellowship Seminar, and I try to uh, keep it both formal and informal. Um, and you can ask me questions um, at the end of the presentation. And as the title suggests, what I'm going to present is what I, the topic I uh, chose then for this uh, uh, seminar is the graphene-based functional hybrids for electrochemical energy systems. And what we learned over the last almost seven, eight years that I was really focused on this energy conversion, storage, harvesting, and hydrogen generation. So it will be basically revolve around the Electrochem applied as well as the fundamental electrochemical uh, applications of the graphene based systems. So let's take a quick look on the carbon allotropy. So everybody knows the basic allotropes or the well known allotropes of carbon are diamond and graphite. Then many other allotropes in the emerged. So these diamond and graphite are the dates back to like centuries uh, ago. It's like an ancient systems, but then the new system, the, the very first, another man-made allotrope, because these are natural allotropes, diamond and graphite, but the man-made allotrope of the carbon, the first one was the fullerene. So Buckminster fullerene or C60. So 60 basically carbon atoms arranged in such a way so that it looks like a soccer ball. Then the, right, around a couple of years later, we happen to learn something about the nanotubes because these are sort of a nanoscale strands, just like a hair, but 10,000 times smaller. So the first one was the multi-wall carbon nanotube and then right two years later, it was a single wall nanotubes and then boom, it was like a nanotechnology nano initiative was in fact back in 1999, initiated by Bill Clinton. And since then, nanoscience and nanotechnology is really thriving. And as you can see, it's like a carbon wonderland. 
there are many other forms of carbon that we have not even get time to touch. And then of course comes the graphene, which of course I'm going to focus on for this presentation. And then if you look at, let me share, let me get my uh, pen here. So if you look here, this particular box, which I call DLC or disordered carbon, but this word disorder is not taken in a negative connotation. So this is a whole bunch of in the, uh, sort of a disordered carbon forms of carbon, we call them diamond-like carbon. Because Why we call them diamond-like? Because they have uh, their sp3 bonded carbon rich. And as a result of which we establish this, as you can see the phase diagram. So it's a triangle and then the vertices of the triangle basically corresponds to the sp3 bonded carbon, sp2 bonded carbon and hydrogen. Depending upon the concentration of these three, we define whether it's amorphous carbon or hydrogenated amorphous carbon, nano diamond and ultra nano diamond and so forth. So let's take a further look on two forms of carbon, the sp3 bonded carbon. So I'm using a sort of a chemical chemistry language according to which where each carbon is basically bonded with four car other carbons. So diamond, as we all know, diamond are the best friend of women. So high pressure, high temperature or natural diamond or high pressure, high temperature that we can grow this single crystal diamond. Then of course we have a micron which size diamond, which is grown back. So the very first patent came from Russia, in fact, 1962. And then there was a little bit of silence till 1990, 1989. And, uh, and we call the low pressure, low temperature, which is my area, one of my area of expertise. So we can use either hot filament, chemical vapor deposition, microwave chemical vapor deposition, and we call them low pressure, low temperature, where you can grow um, sort of a micron size, a couple of hundred microns uh, size uh, diamond, and all the way to nano diamond and ultra nano crystalline diamond means where the grain size is much, much smaller. And we have seen a whole transition in their physical properties and they're, they're really thriving. Then there's another form of uh, uh, nano crystalline diamond, which we call ultra dispersed diamond or detonation diamond. Once again, it was actually first time uh, made back in Russia, 1963, but they took 40 years for them to release the patent for this particular form of diamond, which is also basically a form of nano diamond. And then it has a lot of very interesting properties that I've studied, although I will touch base on this today, uh, because it has a fluorescent prop, because it can emit at room temperature and in the visible region. So they are very promising as a biotech and for biosensing and so forth. Then there are other forms of diamond, like what we call the molecular diamond, which is the diamond doids, which was found in Chevron, Texas. Uh, and, and then in fact, in the nano diamond that I'm talking about, they were also found in the space in intergalactic nuclei. Then we have a whole bunch of another sp2 bonded carbon here. Each carbon is bonded with three carbons. So these are trigonally bonded. So graphite is, one, of course, and then the graph followed by the graphene, and then many other, like even including the Buckminster Fuller image, which has zero, I mean, dimension. Then you have a nano fuse, one dimension. Then you have nano horns, nano horns, which are also very useful for the applications of what I'm going to dis, uh, discuss, like the electrochemical energy storage applications. A lot of work has been done and came out from Japan. And then, of course, the single wall, double wall. Uh, few walls and multi-wall carbon nanotubes, and then of course, what we call them P-pots. And then other than that, this has to two bonded carbon. So for the sake, uh, for the, in the context of the present talk, the activated carbon, which we call the AC in short here that you see, there was the first car carbon capacitor or electrochemical supercapacitor came also in fact in the, from Japan back in 1971, which I'm going to show you more about it. Then there's a porous carbon because everybody started to make a porous. Porosity was important and you will see further on why. Then, so we have a classic graphene, but then are other variants of graphene, which you call them geo or the graphene oxide or reduced graphene oxide because they have a, what we call oxygen functionality either on the basal plane or in the edge plane sites. Then along with the activated carbon, we have activated graphene we have studied. Then we have a functionalized carbon energy depending upon the functionality, be it the oxygenated groups or nitrogenated groups, and even sulfonated groups. Uh, they, are, they showed an enhancement in their uh, charge capacity storage. 
Then there's a whole family of layered materials, as you probably have heard, like graphene and then uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. These are layered systems. That's the beginning of the 2D systems. Then there's a whole family of another layered system, what we call them CDC or carbon derived carbon, or in short, also we have called them maxines. So we have studied a little bit of maxine as well in collaboration with the China. So that is what I'm going to discuss. Then we can also look at these carbons, which is my third area of research, other than the uh, condensed matter physics and uh, biophysics, we call them topology in material science. So we can look at this whole range of carbons that I'm showing you here, topologically as well as geometrically. So uh, we know geometry right from the high school, right? So what is circle or uh, uh, rectangle and uh, cylindrical and so forth. But now there's a whole genre of what we're looking at the materials from topological per perspective, which is purely a mathematical concept. So, and the implications of that, what we people are finding, not much as work has been done. There are only a few groups who are focusing on because it's not so easy to address this, how to incorporate topology because you need a theoretical um, theory people basically. But the, Experimentally, they are showing or have an implications in higher reactivity or activity, electrochemical activity, higher adsorption and desorption capacity, at the, especially at the edges, because these are what we call them topologically protective sites. And then also some implications of the electro, electronic and mechanical properties. And that's what basically what I was talking about, that they have implications for both and, and which are directly relevant for the applications that I have studied. Oops. So my focus and in the context of the present uh, seminar is the energy sector. So when we say energy means that we're looking for alternative energy sources and clean because we are trying to mitigate the greenhouse gas emissions coming from the fossil fuels. So solar and wind, which are intermittent, although the solar is coming quite, quite a bit now, a lot of research is going on in the solar energy since the 1970s, the first time when the amorphous silicon or silicon thin films came along, but they are intermittent. So we are looking for continuously alternative energy sources, how we either storage or conversions, interconversions, or even harvesting. And that's the kind of things I'm going to present. So different energy sources having higher energy efficiency as well as the reliability. So here electrochemistry is definitely playing a role. So this is truly an enabler. So how that, how that works. So we are talking about here, electrochemical energy conversion and storage. So for the energy storage devices, they are sort of broadly speaking, divided into supercapacitor and pseudo capacitors. And then everybody knows about the battery. So people know more about the batteries than the supercapacitors. We know capacitor, but super or ultra capacitor. So what does, why this sort of a, where did it all begin? So back in 1957 was the first, actually uh, uh, sort of a realization, what happens is when you have an electrode, metallic electrode submerged in an electrolyte, half was electrolyte for instance, what happens at the surface when you apply a potential, then positive goes one way, so because there is a positive charge on the electrode, and in order to balance that positive charge, these ions, so positive or the corresponding negative ion, it start to accumulate right next to the positive. So as a result of which, what we call, it forms what the double layer, which is similar to a metal, parallel plate metal capacitor. So you have studied in your undergraduate physics, electrostatics, that if you have a two metal plates parallel, uh, so parallel plate capacitor separated by a certain distance and has a certain area, its capacity is directly proportional to the area and inversely proportional to the uh, distance between the two uh, plates. So if you decrease the distance here, we are talking about one to five or even less than one nanometer. The typical electro, uh, I mean, the capacitors, the carbon capacitors that you can buy from I mean, shops uh, is around five millimeter. So if we reduce by sixth order of magnitude, so by not doing anything, keeping everything same, you increase the capacity automatically by six orders of magnitude. And that is one, this is the sort of a fundamental uh, play of for the energy uh, storage in the supercapacitors or ultra capacitors. So, and as for the battery, so the, the mechanism by which the supercapacitor store charge is through the surface ion adsorption. Unlike in a 
pseudo capacitors, there is the actual electron transfer takes place between the electrode and the electrolyte. And then in the, on the top of it, if there's a structural change because of the insertion of the lithium ion, so lithium ion batteries we all use in our laptops, for instance, um, there is an actual structural change takes place. So, so these are three mechanisms at times can play all together. So as for the materials, so for the supercapacitor carbon-based or carbonaceous materials at a nanoscale are really playing a uh, role that I showed you one of the slides. And for the pseudo capacitive materials where there's an actual electron transfer takes place, these are all transition metal oxides. So ruthenium oxide was one of the classic materials back in 1990s and NASA has studied quite a bit for almost, but this is not environmentally friendly. So other materials in com competition or to replace that are the manganese oxide, the cobalt oxides and vanadium oxides, and then even semiconducting polymers. So all of these materials we have studied along with the molybdenum disulfide as well, and which I'm going to show you some of the results. So further on, what is the, what is the fundamental side onto this, which is not easy to probe by the way. We tried our best uh, using different techniques. So if we look at the structure of this electrochemical double layer, because as we say, the, everything is basically occurring, all the physical, physical chemical processes are taking place at the interface of the electrode and electrolyte. So the classic model was the Helmholtz model and then was uh, refined by a Goy and Chapman model, which take into account of the diffuse layer as well. And then further on, the uh, guy chapman model was further enhanced or uh, 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 was, uh, I mean, modified by Stern. So this is called the guy chapman Stern model, according to which what we have is the first, or what we call the internal, um, uh, the Helmholtz plane and, uh, and outer Helmholtz plane. So, so in other words, this double layer consists of these two layers and then the corresponding diffuse layer. And as you can see here, so these ions are basically solvated, means they are surrounded by the uh, water molecule. So these are called the solvated uh, ions, cation or anion. The corresponding this double layer capacitor is because it's in uh, parallel. So it's given by the one over CH and one over C diffusion, as you can see here, is primarily dominated by the Helmholtz uh, capacitance. So CDL is basically equivalent of a CH because C diffusion is kind of a, uh, uh, large. So this kind of a term cancels out. And then this is all related to, uh, which basically comes from the, our electrostatics poison equation. Then back then it was believed that this is only a parallel plate capacitor as I'm trying to describe you. Although in most of the scenario or circumstances, this model works fairly well, but later on what we learned that it's not, um, in a me, I mean, when we have a, a I, I mentioned, right. So I want to mention something, one more thing. So as you can see here that this capacity is directly proportional to the area so it is not just the area of specific surface area, but also the pore size distribution. And that's why people start to make this material very porous. So the, because it was believed that the pore size has to be larger than the, the solvated ion molecule or solvated ions. But it later on with theoretical uh, calculations, MD simulations, it turned out that this is not true because even the anion by itself which is smaller in size than the solvated, is still be able to store the charge. So, so there are many new uh, understanding of this double layer structure came along in the last couple of years. Then when we look at the properties of these electrochemical energy systems, it's assessed in an industrial scale through what we call the Ravoni plot, which is nothing but a specific power density versus specific energy density. So as you can see here, since I'm sort of focusing around the lithium ion batteries and supercapacitors or electrochemical capacitors. Um, so electrochemical capacitors have a higher uh, power density, unlike the lithium ion battery, which can be, which has higher specific energy density. So why not make the best of both, right? Best of both worlds. So in other words, we need to have the devices 
which basically lie along the diagonals around here, and they can deliver the energy. They can have a higher power density as well as the higher energy density. So it's an interplay of, and that's where the driving towards the development of this engineered electrochemical electrodes come into picture. Okay. And then, of course, other than the uh, aqueous electrolytes, so if we look at the key characteristics of the parameters, so you can look at the energy, which is basically half CV square. So I can increase this energy either by increasing the capacity, which I just described to you, one way, or increasing the potent operating potential window. So but in order to enhance the potential window or increase the potential window range, the other electrolytes came into picture like uh, the organic electrolyte or ionic liquids. And as I mentioned that it is not just the area, which is the geometric area, but it's the specific surface area. And then likewise, for to increase the power uh, density, so by increasing the energy density or by decreasing the, uh, what we call this uh, solution resistance. So which we are talking about like milliohms and, or just a couple of um, tens of milliohms. And then the other way to assess the average power is also through the energy maximum as well as divided by the TD, which is nothing but a discharge time. Okay, so depending upon the mode of measurement. So this is how I already showed you the carbons for energy. Then of course we are focusing among all of these carbons that I have studied. Uh, practically every of these carbon except, uh, uh, I mean the uh, activated carbon, which was already studied extensively. So I'm focusing on the graphene. So as you can see here, there's a whole range of um, uh, possibilities with graphene purely because it has a lot of interesting uh, uh, physical as well as the chemical properties which are relevant for these applications. So it has a very high specific area, 2000, uh, 263 gram per meter square. And then it is uh, uh, e e can easily dissipate the heat then it is also applicable for nanoelectronic devices and uh, fuel cells, then electrocatalytic sensing, like uh, electrochemical glucose and biosensors. We ourselves have studied quite a bit of this. And then large area membranes for water purification. And I'm going to show you in the context of the electrochemical, which is called, called the capacitive deionization or water desilination because, but, but there is a, so here just, we know the classic graphene, which has what we call the Dirac cones, which has a linear dispersion. But in order to maintain this cone and have the corresponding all of these superlative properties, it's not an easy. And that's why people are doing research. So how do we maintain that isolation? In other words, this Dirac cone, that high, um, the electronic density and many other applications, in a 3D graphene system. So it means when we start to stack this graphene. So first we peel the graphene off and then we are stacking them back to make the 3D graphene, which is a challenge. So graphene is important, but so graphene either by itself can play as an active electrode or graphene can also be used as a, a sort of a support system. And then you can decorate that graphene surface depending upon the functionality with other nanomaterials. And that's what I'm going to show you. So other than, of course, and that can be used for polymer solar cells and uh, fuel cells, and as I mentioned before. So, but they are limited by, by themselves. So how do you enhance them? We make the graphene-based hybrids. And that's a golden opportunity because we can control the interfacial properties. We can control uh, uh, through the rich surface chemistry of the graphene, both base plane and the edge sites. So we can play around. So it really provides a rich playground and form these exotic graphene-based hybrids for these applications. So we have, uh, uh, so that's the vision that I put forth uh, when I started studying this. So here, graphene and interaction with the nanomaterials. So this is just a cartoon that I'm showing here with the transition metal oxides, such as cobalt-based or cobalt oxide, and even the cobalt nanoparticles and then manganese oxide, and we also study the vanadium oxide. So this is the pristine surface. So this is more like a physical physics option. Then if there is a defect, which is typically present, there can be electrostatic interaction. So these are different interactions of the graphene with the other nanoparticles. Then it can be a covalently attached. And that is what the property that we have utilized 
by strategizing our synthetic processes or synthesis processes. Or it can be a non-covalent interaction with the defect of these nanoparticles. And then of course we, so this is, so this is oh, everything as I mentioned is occurring at the interface. So here, in a way, we are using this conductive because we know graphene is a conductive um, material and uh, the graphene oxide or reduced graphene oxide that our, becomes our platform for studying this. So I'm going to show, uh, discuss basically a couple of stories uh, at the grand challenges of energy and water. Uh, if the time permits, although I doubt that I will have enough time, to show you the, uh, the search platforms, but at least we can discuss about the uh, electrochemical energies, storage conversion and harvesting. So the, in the first example, the, we combine the graphene. So this was a classic graphene actually, like a monolayer graphene dispersion, as well as we also use the reduced graphene oxide because when we have a graphene oxide, it's not as conductive as the reduced graphene oxide. So reduced means basically we are removing the oxygen, oxygenated groups, and reduced graphene is sort of considered as a equivalent of the graph, classic graphene because classic graphene is not easy to play around. It's uh, sort of a limited because you have to peel it off once you grow it, and so it's, pro it's kind of a heavy processing but we compare that these two together. So here we are using a layer by layer, we call the approach layer by layer electrostatic self-assembly. What does that mean? That we have a graphene with a certain charge and then we uh, functionalize with the polyethylene imine so that it acquires um, a negative charge. And then we have a, um, I'm sorry, it acquires a positive charge. And then we have a functionalized in the multiple carbon nanotube which has a negative charge. So we know positive and negative attract. So this is the electrostatic, just this is a, one of the strategy to combine the two systems. So this is what we call all carbon supercapacitors. And then we deposit them layer by layer and we studied. So basically one layer of graphene and one layer of multiple carbon nanotube. So this bilayer is basically one layer, so to speak. And then we studied them as a function of layers. So the properties that we measure, what we call the cyclic voltammetry, and that's what you see in this in these uh, uh, graphs on the right hand side. So this is a polarization curves, which, which is basically a current versus voltage, and this voltage or the bias, which is with respect to a certain reference electrode. And uh, the more the sort of a rectangular looking like, the better it is, because this is a classic super capacity, super capacitive. Uh, response. And we went all the way from one layer to 15 layers. So one, three, five, and so forth. I'm just showing you as an example for only one layer and a 15 layers. And interestingly, you know, as you can see here, so we determined the capacity or storage capacity using this uh, simple formula, which is basically a charge per voltage, right? And then we apply a different scan rate and, uh, and determine our capacity, which is basically plotted in the bottom two graphs uh, for both graphene and reduced graphene oxide. And you can see here, uh, depending upon the number of layers, it's not necessary, necessary that with increasing number of layers, we uh, increase the capacity. So while for the graphene, the classic graphene, so with increasing the number of layers, we did observe the increasing in the capacity, which is plotted as a function of scan rate, which sort of has start to decrease and that's anticipated. Unlike for the reduced graphene oxide with multiple nanotubes, we observed um, the storage capacity were around four or six layers was the maximum. Um, and then we also performed the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy in order to determine. Uh, so this configuration of the metal electrode, and then you have a graphene, which is your active material, graphene and carbon nanotubes, it can be uh, modeled what we call the Randall circuit or equivalent electrical circuit, which is basically a RC circuit. But then there are other parameters as you can see here. So this is the solution resistance. Then you have a double layer capacitor, and then there's a charge transfer resistance, and then there is a, something called a Warburg impedance. So Warburg impedance is a low frequency response, which is around here. And then this is the high frequency response in the impedance spectroscopy, which is basically nothing but a 
um, imaginary part of the impedance versus the real part of the impedance. And by fitting these, so this is the Nyquist plot, and then this is the phase plot. So by uh, modeling this with this equivalent electrical circuit, we can determine all these parameters, which provides a, even a further insight, a dynamical process, which is occurring at the interface. And then of course, many other parameters by plotting the, for instance, uh, imaginary part of the capacitance with frequency, you can determine the, the time scale. So as you can see here, so we obtain a, 0.33 seconds, so which is like a 33 millisecond, and which is a really great response the very first time. And in fact, it attracted the attention of NASA and we collaborated with the NASA with our this material. So that was, in the second example, we have used the electro deposition of the chemically to allow, as I showed you, of the interaction of these nanoparticles with the graphene, because we wanted to have a covalent interaction so that it has a, makes the bond the nanoparticles or transition metal oxide uh, nanoparticles to the graphene. So we use the electro deposition, which allows the chemical bridging of this interface rather than a physics option. Although we have compared with the physics option, but we have found that if we have a chemically bridged interfaces, it definitely shows a higher response. So we have whole range of in the, these nano uh, uh, cobalt, oxide, COO, CO3 or 4, and even cobalt nanoparticles. Some of the SEM images you can see here. And interestingly enough that we found uh, that we can have a faceted, these cobalt nanoparticles or cobalt oxide nanoparticle using this strategy. And then we in fact also use the electrochemistry to reduce our graphene oxide platform because our starting material was the geo, which we transformed into either RGO or ERGO as we call them. And then we measure the performance in a cyclic voltammetry, as you can see here. And then these redox peaks, as you can see, certain potentials, these are occurring due to. So that shows that there is a, a good inter, interaction between these nanoparticles and the graphene, because they do occur at a certain potentials. And therefore, it is important to measure this potential with respect to the reference electrode. Not, so it's a three electrode assembly. And then, of course, we did the same thing. We also uh, plotted the current versus square root of scan rate, which also allowed us to determine what we call the diffusion coefficients, diffusion of these ions. Uh, it, basically, it allows us to determine whether it's a diffusion limited or uh, 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 reversible or irreversible behaviors and things like that. And then the capacity of certain systems exceeded 500 farad per gram. And industrially, 500, 600, 400, these are all good numbers at, as far as the capacity goes, okay? Then of course, and the, we wanted to expand our understanding from a fundamental perspective of what is happening at the electrode electrolyte interface. So, um, so what we learned from the uh, graphite electrochemistry and then expand, uh, extending it to the graphene electrochemistry that the graphene surface or basal plane as we call it, it's not as electrochemically active as compared to the edges. And that is why these uh, sort of morphologically controlled uh, domains allow for the higher electroactivity, so to speak. So we wanted to enhance the edge sites. So that's the idea, okay? So we use what we call a scanning electrochemical microscopy, which I established in my lab when I was in, uh, where this work uh, uh, was performed. Uh, in my lab, what we call a scanning electrochemical microscopy, which allowed us to determine the, uh, I mean, it can image the electro surfaces over a very large area. So it can map the electrochemical activity, as you can see here in three-dimensional as well as a two-dimensional, these ups and downs. So over a large area of, I'm talking about like a 400 or 500 micrometer by 500 micrometer square, which is pretty good. Uh, I mean, good area as compared to the S, uh, scanning probe microscopy, which is like an AFM, for instance, you may have heard of it. And not only that, that it can image the electrochemical activity, but it also using what we call the probe approach curves. And by fitting these uh, phenomen phenomenological model, we can determine what we call the heterogeneous electron transfer rate. And some of these over here on this table I'm showing here. So this is the first order electron transfer rate, the K1 coefficient that we can determine using these probe approach curves. And 
So higher this K1 rate, the higher the electron transportation. And it means it's a faster and rapid transportation. So these elect electro engineered electrochemical el electrodes is start to provide us that which material would be the ideal if we want to really implement for an industrial at an industrial level. So as you can see here, CO three O four on electrochemically reduced graphene oxide showing the highest on the K one, and then followed by uh, some of these like a CO three on GO and so forth. Then in the third example, we combine with the manganese oxide, and then we have compared both electrochemically deposited manganese oxide as well as the physis option uh, uh, manganese oxide. And, and in fact, interestingly enough, that our capacity for the manganese oxide on graphene oxide, it ex exceeded almost in the 550 uh, at 5 millivolt per second. And this was the equation that I was talking about when you plot the current versus square root of scan rate, it provided us the, the behavior. So the diffusion limited behavior and so forth. And then once again, we uh, basically use the, uh, the same technique to image our electrode surface activity. And interestingly enough, as you can see here, that the whole surface is not fully or uniformly activated, despite the fact that the material is deposited everywhere. And that is, and that was basically pro, um, sort of a start to provide us insights that how to maximize this electrochemical activity. So this is uh, basically sort of in a, in a, uh, a summary of these uh, graphene-based uh, hybrids with the transition metal oxide. And this, this also includes the results from vanadium uh, pentaoxide. And then we published all this work in different, different places. Um, and this is the charge transfer resistance determined from the impedance spectroscopy and so forth. And we actually utilized even, a, a, this was one way of probing the structure of the electro electrolyte interface using, as I said, a scanning electrochemical microscopy, which not only determines the electron transfer rate, but also images or ma map the electrochemical activity. Uh, we also, in fact, uh, use the Raman spectroscopy, but in the interest of time, I, I do not include that. So this is in a uh, sort of a, in a sort of a, what was the impact of all this studying this nano engineered electrodes for electrochemical energy storage all the way from carbon onions to nanotubes, the graphene and activated graphene or activated carbon. Um, and then we combined with the uh, carbon nanotubes. So we call them all carbon capacitors and then the uh, metal oxides. And then we use even um, some molecules, what we call them polyoxometallates um, and then conducting polymers and so forth. Um, and this was on the, I'm going to show you uh, just a couple of slides on the graphene and molybdenum disulfide for hydrogen evolution reaction. And then in the energy conversion, uh, we designed these uh, 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 lithium ion battery anodes. So the current lithium ion battery anodes are graphite, but with cycling, it tends to cycling of the lithium ion insertion and deinsertion intercalation or deintercalation with time is basically to start to degrade and therefore we have to change the battery. So here we utilized the graphene again and with porous silicon. So the other candidate was the silicon for the anode. But silicon, although it has a higher capacity, but it's also very, it's very rigid so it can break faster. So structural breakdown or degradation it's not as good as if you combine with some softer systems. So we use the sort of a porous graphene and then coat it with the carbon and then combine with the porous silicon and we tested some of the uh, uh, simple, so in, in the lithium ion battery, that's the kind of work we just did over here. And it did provide in the first sort of uh, uh, experiments, reasonable uh, specific capacity and so forth. So let me start with the energy harvesting. So so now we are trying to use these graphene-based uh, electrodes for thermal energy harvesting. So everybody probably you have heard of thermoelectrics. And in fact, the Dr. Priya's group does a lot of work on this thermoelectrics. But other than the thermoelectrics, and then of course you have a, a perovskite solar cells and then piezoelectrics, some piezotronics and so forth. But instead of a thermoelectrics, which is the basic principle is the 
but if you have a difference in temperature, the delta T is basically converting into a delta V. So these are, um, so thermoelectrics are for the higher uh, thermal sources or thermal load, but here, what I want to show you for the low grade uh, thermal energy harvesting, and it's not the, the classic feedback, but thermoelectrochemical energy harvesting. So once again, I'm utilizing the electrochemistry um, for harvesting this low grade heat. So the, the classic cell, what we call the galvanic cell is consist of, again, you have a hot anode and you have a cold cathode, which is um, uh, enclosed with the uh, redox electrolyte. So this is a mixture of ferro and ferricyanide. And then you have, I mean, because of the temperature difference and the temperatures that we use typically like from 40 or 50 degrees to 100 degrees Celsius, this allows us to uh, decompose or we have a reduction and oxidation. So oxidation at the hot anode and the reduction at the cold cathode and as a result of the separation of the charge, the electrons start to flow. And then of course you can extract that energy and convert into a power, thermal power. So instead of electronic feedback, you have an ionic feedback. And the merits of this particular system, which is fairly simple, as long as you have your active redox electrolyte, it doesn't have a moving mechanical parts. It's a direct thermal, thermal to energy conversion. And in a self-regenerated way, because you don't have to, so this sort of does not require a enough, lot of maintenance, so to speak. And it's a G zero carbon emission, which is one of the goals of the government as well. And as I said, it's maintenance free and it can be stable over an extended period. And in fact, although we have used the aqueous electrolytes, but now there is a research going on to utilize the organic electrolytes because the, the vaporization will be less. So we, so for this particular application, what we did here, we uh, developed what we call the three-dimensional mesoporous <coughs> graphene carbon nanotube aero aerogels. And as you can see here, so this is the classic, very simple, but looks uh, uh, complicated, but it's a very straightforward hydrothermal synthetic approach where we have a graphene oxide and we have a functionalized multiple carbon nanotube depending upon the ratio. And so we studied the whole range. And then in, even we, we also doped uh, the nitrogen doping to make it sort of a negative uh, impurity in these graphene systems or aerogel system. And then you heat it for a, almost a day at a very low temperatures of 85 degrees Celsius. And uh, you get the hydrogels and then uh, you freeze dry and then you carbonize it to have a better crystallinity. And you get what we call them aerogel monoliths. So we just use both hydrothermal and solvothermal synthetic approach. And you can see here uh, in the SEM or the corresponding uh, computed X-ray computed tomography that shows a beautiful, this topological interconnected network. And that's what it allows us to expose as much edges and as much surface of graphene as we can, or I mean the graphene and carbon nanotubes, both of them. So this topological interconnectedness allows us the faster ion transportation, more sites. And so these are some of the properties that we utilize for our thermogalvanic cell construction. So we use in the, uh, or you see here two different configurations. So one is a classic coin cell, which is like a, the coin cell, the button cells that we can buy again from the shops, for instance, and where we replace our electrodes. So we use this either symmetric configuration, means both the cathode and anode the same material, or even the asymmetric, means two different materials. Interestingly enough, we found if we have asymmetric, it means different materials. We didn't try, of course, all the combinations because there was a lot of work, but we used a couple of them and we observed that the asymmetric has a slightly better performance than the symmetric, interestingly enough. In the another configuration, which is basically a simulation of what I showed you before, the cylindrical cell where you have a hot end, which is through the uh, resistive heater. And then this is placed in a basically ice cold uh, water for the cold end. And what we obtained, I'm just showing you the efficiency right now. And we compared with platinum, which is the classic material 
So I forgot to mention that for the classic material for the thermoelectrochemical energy conversion was the platinum, but platinum is very expensive. So therefore we are looking for the alternative electrodes. And then also it was believed back then the electrodes really don't play much of a role, but which is not true because you need to have the ion transportation and faster. So for some of these reason, reasons, so this research, there are some, some people are doing, some groups are doing this research and carbonaceous material once again, sort of a, is so, uh, one of the, at the forefront. And so the power conversion efficiency relative to Carnot efficiency, we arrived with our aerogels almost 4%. So although it looks rather small uh, efficiency, only 4%, but this is in this low grade heat, uh, it is considered to be feasible. In other words, you can make a very small devices. And since these are conformal, you can make a device, which is, you can wrap around, let's say heat pipes in the buildings and can extract like a micro watt. So it's a low power and low, uh, low grade heat uh, energy harvest. So from the fundamental perspective, because I always like to do the, some fundamental study along with the applications. So what we did is we utilized all of these materials, these aerogels, and we wanted to establish what we call a structure activity relationship or a structure electrochemical activity relationship. So we combine the Raman spectroscopy and the scanning electrochemical microscopy because in the Raman spectroscopy of carbon systems, and if you are studying carbon, you have to measure the Raman, uh, so the classic bands, which we call the disorder activated band, the D band around 1300 and G band, which is a, coming from the graphite or graphene uh, that we exist in any sp2 bonded carbon system. If you take any sp2 bonded carbon system, you must have a G, G band. Um, and then you take the ratio, intensity ratio of D to G band, what we can determine is the defect density. And we establish the defect density versus the electrochemical activity or electron transfer rate, the same K1 coefficient that I showed you before. And we establish what we call these uh, quantitative relationships. And we can see that you require a moderate amount of defects in order to have a better electrochemical activity. Am I running out of time? Yeah, there's 10 minutes um, oh, till 11. Okay. So okay. if you just if Thank you. we leave a couple minutes for questions. Sure. sure. Thank you. So I want to show you next, as we say, water, water everywhere, but there's no drop, any drop to drink. Does anybody know where, where that came from? So this was actually, it came from a poem back in 1834 text, because this guy Samuel wrote this poem for this ill-fated he hero who was surrounded, who got stuck in the ship and uh, surrounded by the ocean. And you know that the ocean has a very higher uh, concentration, so you can't drink that water. It's not drinkable, despite you're surrounded. So that's where this basically came from. And then, so the challenge is that currently, if you know that 2.2 billion people live in areas where there is no pure water. And then 1.4 million children die every year due to diarrhea, because the water again is very is poor. Then there's an arsenic problem. So there are, so water purification is Part of the solution. So either you filter the water or you desalinate the water, right? So we have actually studied both, but I'm going to show you only one. So again, comes the graphene, comes to the rescue. So graphene, because it's an atomic tin, it even despite it is atomic tin, it doesn't allow the helium to pass through, which is the smallest molecule, interestingly enough. So that is the membrane development or large area membrane development. The other, which is the uh, used in the, what we call the reverse osmosis process. So when we get the water, the pure water in our homes or uh, offices, this is industrially, they use the reverse osmosis process as least one of the, but the other technology to desalinate water is the capacitive deionization. So once again, it utilizes the electrochemical principle, basically, you're separating the positive ion and the negative ion depending upon the direction of your application of your voltage, as simple as that, okay? So positive, like suppose if you have sodium chloride, sodium ion will go one way, so Na plus will go one way and Cl minus will go other way. And you feed the water, which is basically your uh, concentrate, I mean, the salty water, 
and you get the fresh water out of it because these ions are being absorbed by these carbonaceous electrodes. So using this principle, once again, the same uh, aerogels actually, the monoliths we designed our CDI electrodes and you can see the porosity levels is pretty, pretty nice looking here with the electron uh, microscopy. And we design this, what we call the CDI flow through cell, means the water is passing through. So you feed, which is the um, influent and then the effluent. And then we measure the current response, we call them IT uh, amperometry. So current versus time, and depending upon the potential. So we start with 0.8 volt, one volt. So with the interval of 0 0.2, and we went all the way to 1.8 volt. And you can see with increasing voltage, of course, your current is decreasing, means your conductivity is decreasing, right? And that's what exactly we want. It means the ions are getting absorbed. And we have determined the ionic conductivity for all of these materials, as you can see here in this histogram. And so it is not just the surface area, but also the porosity and the packing density that I'm talking about this topological interconnectedness in such a way. So it is a really a very convoluted system but it is performing greatly. And interestingly, you know, my excitement that one of my students was traveling with his family and he brought the ocean water, which is the Atlantic ocean water, which was 35 times or even 45 times saltier than that we were testing in our lab. And in fact, it ate away our electrode. And uh, so we had to cover it with some copper to protect the electrode. And we tested that only in just one cycle, it reduced by almost 45%. Interestingly enough. So that is really one of the success stories here. I'm will uh, probably, I think I should stop here. I just wanted to show you that, but I can stop and take the questions instead of hurrying this up. But right. I, Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, just one second before I, I would like to acknowledge. So I like to acknowledge because I didn't do, of course, all the work by myself. So we, I had collaborators from Louisville, Texas, even my Kentucky University, and then the uh, Air Force, Los Alamos, and then a lot of students, all of them were in Kentucky that I have uh, mentored and they did amazing work. Sarah did an excellent work, Romney, um, some of the names that I really would like to mention, Brandon, Alex, Taylor, and Eli and Carson, They're, and Wyatt, they've done amazing work, which made my life happier. So I'd like to definitely acknowledge and thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Sanju, for this great talk. Excellent. So we have we have a few minutes for questions and answer. Um, sure. Good. So you could actually, since we have only a small audience, you could actually go ahead and unmute yourself and ask question. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Sure. Um, how did you deposit graphene on ITO or on other? Uh, so we materials? use the spin coating as well as the drop casting and, and the dip casting. So both drop casting and dip casting worked, worked really good for us. You got single layer graphene? We had a monolayer graphene, yes. We had the layer graphene in one case and which we are called GR. And then in another case, we have a reduced graphene oxide dispersion. And what were the sizes of, uh, of this um, um, monolayer graphene sections? You mean the lateral? L lateral, yes. So it was around uh, 500 nanometers for the, for the graphene. And for the reduced yes. graphene oxide, we had around 350 nanometers. Right. But since we were coating like one layer, then one layer of uh, graphene and one layer of uh, multi-wall nanotube, and then again, one layer of graphene and multi and so forth. So yeah, but the lateral size of our platelets were that. Thank you. Hey, Sanju, I wanted to ask one question. Sure. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, in one of the slide in power density, of this uh, nanotube uh, graphite combination. Uh -huh. Can you go to that slide? There is uh, this power density numbers that you have put there. Yes. 
Uh, in, in the table, in the table, there was a table. table. Yes. Yeah, right here. So uh, this uh, watt hour per kilogram and watt per gram. So uh -huh. why they are not uh, similar? So in, uh, in this carbon on ion things, it's 8.5 watt hour per kilo and 153 watt per gram. In other case, in the hybrid, it's 110 watt per kilo and 400 watt per gram. So why they don't go hand in hand? In one case, seems like you are so, watt talking hour about per kilo is a lot higher compared to watt per gram. You are saying the carbon onions and graphene carbon nanotube hybrids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so, why they are not comparable? No, what I'm saying is uh, the watt hour per kilo increase uh -huh. from 8.5 to 110, uh -huh. but the uh, watt per gram changes only from one, 153 to 400. So why that proportion is not uh, same? So, uh, okay, so ad hoc, what I can think of is basically what are their operating conditions? What electrolytes they use? So there are a lot of parameters which play a vital role. People usually don't report these ways. It should be reported that way. What are the, even the area, what are the uh, size of their electrodes? So there are a lot of parameters which are missing in the, in the literature. And people report just values. Oh, I got this high density or high specific energy density. But nobody really knows what, why, and what, what's going on behind the scene. So these values, of course, the carbon onions are taken from the literature. And this is, of course, coming from our values, I mean, our study. Okay. So these subtle differences can play in these numbers. Yeah, some of that uh, translation. Yeah, the it's only like, difference, Bait, is maybe the, the hour terms maybe come from the frequency. And that also matters oh, also the, the frequency it probably is uh, so the 400 watt per gram was was basically divided by frequency to get the other so is that a discharge rate or something yes that's right so you can determine the power either through the energy divided by the discharge time or you can determine from the e square over 4 rs and that also matters by the way because sometimes people don't always study the impedance spectroscopy. They just do the cyclic voltammetry and galvano, uh, galvano static measurements. So that also matters by the way. So all these things matter. Yeah. yeah. So how do these uh, compare with the uh, current state of the art? I think uh, what we see in cell phone batteries are, are so, a little bit higher than this one, I think. Right. Yes, so that's a. Now we're talking the real thing. So of <laughs> course, there's a tons. So you, if you click, you know, Google will spill out like I don't know, hundred thousand literature. I mean the references, right? So where where do we stand today? So as far as the capacity is, we achieve the capacity, in majority of the part. Okay. So first, are you are one is one focusing on the super capacity? Super capacitors or pseudo capacitors, or is one focusing on the lithium ion battery, which is another whole genre, right? So, a lot of work going on the lithium ion battery, the graphene based systems, and porous silicon. Some real good work came out from Stanford. One, in fact, and there was a lady at the University of Louisville, she did some good work in that as well. Which, so, where do we stand? So, if I need to, if I have to answer to a, let's say, a, a industrial person, so I would say capacity we achieved, reliability is an issue right now. And uh, for the super capacitors, power density, but then we have an issue with the, this, uh, the solution resistance or as well as the power delivery time. So T, uh, TD, not TD, but the uh, T. So response time, I should say, that how fast it can deliver. And that also linked with the solution resistance. So these are some of these issues around here. And then large scale, because if you want to use them, like in a grid scale, of course you need a large area electrodes, like a meter by meter or real, real large sizes. 
So as far as the super capacitor and ultra capac uh, capacitor, that's one of the issue. But when it comes to the lithium ion battery, as for the carbonaceous system, graphene and porous silicon right now is at the top right now. Then people are also testing lithium sulfur batteries, for instance. Over there, once again, reliability is an issue. Especi energy density people are achieving, at least some of the people, if not all of them. Then comes the electrolytes. And then mm. the, how do you combine? Because then people study these, either they study cathode or they study only anode or they study only electrolyte. Then you have, a, of course, organic electrolyte or ionic liquids. So what type of organic electrolyte which allows the better interaction with your electrode? So there are all these components. So there are a lot of work has been done on each of these components, but when you combine them together, they don't work. Yeah. Yep. Then something or the other doesn't work. And that's where the challenge right now is. All this combination and permutation and combination is not working. By itself is working, but not permutation and combination. And that's where the challenge is which material to pick. And that's why industry hasn't picked up yet. So, yep. so, so, so lithium carbonate, lithium carb, uh, cobalt oxide or lithium manganese oxide on the cathode side, and then combined with the carbon, people are studying. We, I, st I tested my own actual electrode. I mean, the cathode for a lithium ion battery. We didn't get a best response. And then of course we didn't spend too much time on that anyway. So, so these are some of the issues right now. So all these numbers, I mean, yes, people are achieving whatever and they're reporting in all these papers, but, and then large area again. So it's scalability and reliability then, 10,000 hours, typical. So these are some of the issues in this area. Thank you, Sanjay. Yep. Sure. Right, Sanjay, I think we have passed time. So thank you again for sure. this great talk. Um, very, very interesting field. Of course, it's it's always remained a very interesting field. Um, so thank you very much. And thanks very much, all of you, for attending, especially folks from international places uh, of being awake late in the night. Really appreciate it. So please... Uh, uh, look for the announcement for next call uh, pack announcement from Sadie, and she will be sending out email. If you don't receive uh, email from Sadie, then uh, please contact us using the address on the Pack Fellowship website, um, and she will be happy to add you onto the email list. Anything else, Sadie, before we disconnect? I do not have anything. We're working on um, the next speaker, so I don't have a date yet. Okay. All right. So thanks very much, everyone. Have a good day and, and good night to people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye.